It's a very broad sort of positioning you did. I mean, I have to first start by saying that while it is my side of the story, the main intent was in fact not to try to argue my innocence or to present evidence to refute the judgment. It was more to say, okay, here's how I experienced it. The primary reason I wrote this book was actually to hopefully give an idea to people uh, of a sort of certain way of leading a life, of life philosophy, of lessons I've learned. But I didn't want to make it into a, you know, here are the ten lessons, one, two, three, four, and if you follow them. It is a book that you have to invest a little bit of yourself because you have to read it and see yourself in it and then be able to say, okay, here's what he did. And it's a, almost learning by a little bit of osmosis rather than by a lecture. So there is nowhere in the book you'll find this is what you should do. What you'll find is that experiences I had, how I reacted, uh, you know, philosophy that I held, um, and how it manifested itself in different situations. And hopefully the same is true for you, every one of you who read it can read, relate to some of the situations. That's one thing I would say. The, the, the second thing I want to say is that one of the great lessons, my, my father used to always say, and I read this in the book, that things will happen to you, but it's really how you react to it. How do you, in fact, that what you read is a wonderful thing, is how can you turn your troubles into something of a great learning experience? And um, I resolved that was the way I was going to, I could have been bitter, I could have been very angry, I could have been, why is it happening to me? Um, I simply accepted that it was happening to me, but then how do I turn whatever is happening to me into a strength for myself? Uh, people think, how can that be? I mean, I, I, I almost, I say in the book, I learned a lot from my time in prison. I almost enjoyed my experience, but that'll be, that's crazy. It's not so crazy, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's very few individuals, not that I wish it on anybody, have, you know, been through the highs. I've addressed the United Nations, you know, heads of state on, you know, the role of business and society but I've also been in solitary confinement, handcuffed and... So, you know, the range of experiences in itself is an enriching thing. And you learn a lot of lessons out of that. Where would I get the time that I had to reflect uh, when I was in prison? Uh, quite... Uh, you just... You, the pace of life doesn't allow you to do that. And there is not much to do in prison. You just are with you, yourself, with your thoughts. Um, even, you know, when I thought that solitary confinement was almost like torture, and I should have been very, very angry at it, and I'm sure I was going through it not very happy about it. But in the end, if I reflect on it, it gave me a great deal of learning. Firstly, I had an opportunity to read the Bhagavad Gita six or seven times in those seven weeks. I would have never taken that time. I read pieces of it here and there. Um, it allowed me to cope. It brought context and meaning to those seven weeks. You know, it was like, I don't know, many of you may have gone to Vipassana. It was like Vipassana for seven weeks. You don't speak to anybody, you don't do anything, you are in a very, you know, tough surrounding. I'm, I, I can tell you that, for example, the, the solitary confinement cell is about the size of where our chairs are and, you know, this kind of square. It's all steel, cold steel furniture, right? There's a bunk bed, there's a steel toilet, there's a little steel table with a steel stool harsh, 
cold cement floor and there's this big door like six inches thick with this tiny glass window in it and a slot that is horizontally cut which is locked and that's where they feed you your meal when they open the door and they slide a tray of your food if you're not in time it'll fall to the floor and you have to pick up the food from the floor and eat you go through such extraordinary indignities uh, they give you one uniform to wear and what you have to do is in front of the guard who is looking at you, you have to strip hand over the dirty uniform then they'll send you the next one um, countless other indignities that you suffer but at the same time if you can look at that and you say what can you take out of that how does it what is the context what is the meaning of this and one of the great lessons there are many in the Bhagavad Gita one of them has to do with equanimity about to take good things and bad things in its own stride happiness and sorrow are the same things and it's more to do with how you really internalize it how you take it and I must say if you have if you survive seven weeks in solitary confinement and were able to do with it, that with equanimity you can almost survive anything um, so I feel I've come out of the whole experience much richer uh, I have more empathy uh, I never come across people that I met in prison in my life before I spent many months weeks and months with them I tried to help them I tried to understand them they became good friends to this day they are good friends I keep connected with them you know I do little things for uh, I had this guy named Manny who was a Spanish guy he uh, was a very tough one of these very tough bodybuilder types and on his chest were five tattoos of five women they were his five daughters he had these tattoos all around his chest beautifully done with five different women he led an ex ex extraordinary different life he was arrested three times for drug uh, dealing but he done, didn't deserve a 25 year sentence he was there for 25 years but as a person he was a extraordinary he was so helpful to me and so when he came out he wanted to start a baking business so I helped him start a baking business and hopefully he'll stay straight but you get you I would have never had a chance to meet people like that and it uh, helped me enrich my life experience mm -hmm.